The business for next week will be Monday, the 30th of September, debate to approve a motion relating to Section 7 of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Etc. Act 2019, Historical Institutional Abuse, followed by debate to approve a motion relating to Section 6 of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Etc. Act 2019, Victims Payment, followed by Debate to approve a motion relating to Section 5 of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Etc. Act 2019, Human Trafficking. Followed by Debate to approve a motion relating to Section 4 of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Etc. Act 2019, Gambling. Tuesday, the 1st of October. Motion to approve a statutory instrument relating to the draft common organisation of the markets in agricultural products, transitional arrangements, etc. Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019. Followed by motion to approve a statutory instrument relating to the draft common agricultural policy and common organisation of the markets in agricultural products, miscellaneous amendments EU Exit Regulations 2019. Followed by Motion to approve a statutory instrument relating to the draft import and export licenses amendments EU exit regulations 2019. Followed by. <laughs> followed by. Motion to approve a statutory instrument relating to the draft pesticides amendment EU exit regulations 2019. Wednesday, the 2nd of October, second reading of the domestic abuse bill. It was worth waiting for, I think. <laughs> Thursday, the 3rd of October, debate on a motion relating to women's mental health, followed by general debate on the spending of the Ministry of Justice. These subjects and times for debates were determined by the Backbench Business Committee. Friday, the 4th of October, the House will not be sitting. Thank you. The Shadow Leader of the House, Valerie Vaz. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Leader of the House for the business statement? And he will know that this could actually have been agreed through the usual channels. Uh, and we are trying to compromise and come to a consensus, and there would have been no need for this division. But, Mr. Speaker, this is no way to run a parliament. And, and earlier today, uh, we heard how we have to start as we mean to go on and to respect each other in the way we speak to each other. So I do want to ask the Leader of the House if he could ask the Attorney General to come to the House to apologise. Calling us a dead parliament and calling us turkeys is not appropriate language. If the Attorney General so dislikes parliament, perhaps he should spend more time with his cases and call a by-election. But I know the Leader of the House has also apologised to Dr David Nicholl, and this is just taking up from where we left off prior to the adjournment of the House. Could the Leader apologise here in the House to Dr David Nicholl to say that he was wrong and that what he said was untrue? Um, he also didn't answer my question about the constitutional coup. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thought we'd eradicated foot and mouth. But if the Leader of the House wants some business, let me give him some business. The Financial Services Bill, Report Stage, date to be announced. Immigration and Social Security uh, Withdrawal Bill, Report Stage, date to be announced. Agriculture Bill, Report Stage, date to be announced. Fisheries Bill, Report Stage, date to be announced. Trade Bill, it's had its third reading in the House of Lords on Wednesday the 20th of March, and it's in ping pong. Does the government expect to get the bills through before the 31st of October 2019? And could I ask the Leader of the House again, how long does he think the preparations will be needed before the Queen's speech on the 14th of October? When will Parliament be prorogued? I'd be grateful if the Leader of the House could provide time for a debate uh, on the Electoral Commission report which has estimated that between 8.3 and 9.4 million people in Great Britain who are eligible to be on the local government registers are not correctly registered, and there are between 4.7 and 5.6 million inaccurate entries on these registered. This is the first study since the 2015 assessment of the registers following the transition to individual electoral registration. This is seriously disenfranchising people. My honourable friend, the Shadow Minister for Youth and Voter Engagement, has raised this continuously. 
Perhaps that's why the government is so keen to have an election while the registers aren't up to date. But I, I note uh, the Foreign Secretary's statement yesterday on the cases of Nazanin and Mr Ashori raised by Honourable Members for Hampstead and Kilburn and the Honourable Member for Lewisham East. Could I ask the Leader of the House if he's had any conversations with the Foreign Secretary uh, and if the Foreign Secretary has met with Richard Radcliffe or other members of the, of, of the families of those people, British nationals, who have been incarcerated in Evan Prison. These are lost lives. We cannot wait any longer. They're losing times with their family. But, Mr Speaker, I want to thank the Leader of the House for his kind words yesterday on my nomination to the Privy Council. And sitting next to him, I want to congratulate my right honourable friend, the Solicitor General, who's also been elevated to the Privy Council. I know he's, he's very excited about yeah. meeting Her Majesty. And we have finally good news from the Whip's office. We want to welcome Evelyn Christine Rose Puddick. The Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Lady says quite correctly this is no way to run a Parliament, which is why we should have a general election as soon as possible. And if only, if only they would vote for it and would have the courage of their convictions, um, we, would, we would have one. She then complains that the Attorney General has called this uh, a turkey Parliament. I think it's more of a chicken Parliament, because it is trying to flap away from the general election that we need and that would clear the air. And yes, we get gesticulation and murmurations coming forth from the benches opposite, saying that we are going to get one. But when, Mr Speaker, when? The country wants one as soon as um, possible. Um, and this Parliament, I, I, I think, rather than dead, I would use the word adult, like the Parliament of 1614, uh, which was known as the adult Parliament. This, I think, may also come to be known in such a way. Uh, the Right Honourable Lady mentions Dr Nichols. I am happy to repeat the apology I gave before. Um, and she referred to a question I answered at some length yesterday uh, on the question of a coup. What I pointed out uh, was that um, if things are said in Cabinet, the 30-year rule means that they will come out in 30 years. But just because newspapers print gossip from Cabinet meetings does not make it fact, and I fully support and stand by what the Prime Minister has said, which I will read out again for the benefit of honourable and right honourable members, which is, I have the highest respect, of course, for our judiciary and the independence of our courts. But I must say I strongly disagree with this judgment, and we in the UK will not be deterred from getting on and delivering on the will of the people to come out of the EU on October the 31st, because that is what we were mandated to do. So that is my... Uh, position. She mentioned a number of bills that are blocked. One of the advantages of prorogation, had it taken place, was we could start afresh, start with new bills, better bills, bigger bills, brilliant bills, and that is what will happen when eventually we get to a Queen's speech. Um, and the Right Honourable Lady asks about the timings for the Queen's speech. I think the best thing for me to tell her is that is being discussed with Black Rod. Very few changes need to be made in this chamber for a Queen's speech, but quite a number of changes need to be made uh, in the House of Lords for the Queen's speech, in addition to the unsightly barriers that are there for security, which are, of course are removed prior to a Queen's speech and the road closures associated with that. So it's trying to work out simply the timings to ensure that any prorogation meets the requirements uh, of the Supreme Court's um, judgment. She asks for a debate on the Electoral Commission's report. It is obviously key and in all our interests that electoral registers should be up to date, though some of us also feel it is important that parliamentary constituencies should be up yes. to date, which would be beneficial. And I am interested to see that some members of the opposition bench are keen uh, on boundary changes, and I note that with great interest. Um, and finally, my right, the Right Honourable Lady asked me uh, about uh, the dual nationals held illegally by Iran and whether I have had any conversations with the Foreign Secretary. Yes, indeed, I asked him about it yesterday, and he has spoken to his Iranian counterpart about all the dual nationals, including, of course, uh, Mrs. Zaghari Radcliffe, as did the Prime Minister when he saw the President of Iran on the fringes of the meeting in the United Nations. So I hope I can reassure her that the the government continues to push, and may I thank her for continuing to push, because 
repeating things every week actually is powerful. It does keep people on their toes, and I hope she will continue to do that. Justine Greening. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Far from being uh, a zombie parliament, actually, there are lots of bills that we could consider passing. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that the Leader of the House has scheduled a second reading for the domestic abuse bill, but there are other private members' bills, including one I was seeking to bring through the House, that have all party support. And the credit worthiness assessment bill could help millions of renters get improved credit scores. Is one idea for the government to look at some of these private members' bills, seeing as the House is now sitting unexpectedly, and actually put them through into law? Well, well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. It has to be said uh, that this Parliament has passed more private members' bills than any since 2003. Thirteen have gone to royal assent, and additional Fridays were made available. I think it was absolutely right that additional time was made available, but the essential point of what we are trying to do is to get through the public business that the government was elected to get through. That is what we are aiming for, and we have done well on private members' bills, but I doubt that there will be additional time for them. Brady. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to echo the calls for the importance of temperate language in our exchanges in the House. Um, I also uh, join the congratulations of the uh, right honourable shadow leader of the House. I do feel now that my honourable friend for Perth and North Perthshire is going to be left out at these exchanges, and his privy councillorship really must be expedited as a matter um, of urgency. Um, the business, such as it is next week, uh, we are very happy to support uh, all the efforts to restore uh, the uh, operation of devolved government in Northern Ireland. Uh, but my heart does bleed for the poor Conservative ministers and backbenchers who will have to come to the House now during their conference. Successive SNP chief whips have used the usual channels to communicate the dates of our conferences over the years, um, and at no point have we been afforded with a recess, um, despite our status as the third party in this place. Um, in fact, the target date for the Queen's, or it may not be the target date for the Queen's speech now, is the second day of the SNP conference. And given that none of us have yet mastered the art um, of bilocation, I would be interested in the Leader of the House's recommendations for those circumstances. Uh, but given that the House is to continue meeting, thanks in no small part due to the efforts of my honourable and learned friend from Edinburgh South West, I want to emphasise what my uh, right honourable friend for Perth and North Perthshire said last night. The standing orders of this House provide for three opposition days per session in the name of the leader of the third party. And in two years, Mr Speaker, we have had one and a half days. So however long this session runs for before the next legal prorogation, the Leader of the House really needs to find time for us to fulfil our role as the third party in this House, the largest party in Scotland, and as the standing orders of this House, which he considers to be sovereign, uh, require. Knowing how much he cherishes uh, the procedures and customs of this place, I am sure he is the last person that would want to be in breach of either the spirit or the letter of those standing orders. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I agree with the hon. Gentleman. Temperate language. Uh, is often to be encouraged. And he mentioned by location. I think Padre Pio, not um, that long ago canonised, was famed for his ability uh, to be in two places at once, and there's very good evidence for this. I'm surprised the SNP do not consider themselves sufficiently saintly to be able to achieve uh, the same task and be both at their conference uh, and away from it. The most important point that the honourable gentleman raised is about the opposition day for the SNP. Well, I will say on behalf of Her Majesty's Government that they may have an opposition day any day next week, should they wish to have a vote of confidence, it will be theirs. Dame Cheryl Gillan. Mr Speaker, you will know the threat that is posed to our countryside in Buckinghamshire, and particularly at the moment despite all the rain that is falling, the drought which has caused the problems with our chalk streams. Could the Leader of the House give us an opportunity, now we're back in Parliament, to discuss the excellent report uh, made by Julian Glover and his team into national parks? And in particular, we would be able to debate his recommendation that the Chilterns AONB is a suitable subject to get the protection of national park status. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, anything that my right hon. Friend says is likely to be an excellent idea, so I have a great deal of sympathy for her request for a debate, but I am afraid I will once again throw it over uh, to the Chairman of the Backbench Business Committee, because I think it is entirely suitable uh, for that committee. Ian Mearns. Very grateful, Mr. Speaker. Can I add my congratulations to my right hon. Friend, the Shadow Leader of the House, for her elevation to, to, the, uh, to the Privy Council? Um, can I also thank the Leader of the House for announcing the Backbench Business for next Thursday, two debates on women's mental health and on the spending of the Ministry of Justice. Can I also re- remind the House that the Backbench Business Committee is still accepting applications for debates and applications can be submitted until 2.30 tomorrow for consideration next week and that the Committee will need to meet as soon as possible next week uh, on our return. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That is an enormously and characteristically, if I may say so, helpful intervention from the Chairman of the Backbench Business Committee. And members will have heard 2.30 tomorrow is the deadline for applications. Sir John Hayes. Mr. Speaker, we are what we remember. Each of us is comprised by where we have been, who we have known, and what we have done. But when dementia robs people of all of that. They are bewildered and their friends and families fearful. 850,000 people suffer from dementia in this country, Mr Speaker, 63,000 of them under the age of 65. And it won't be lost on you uh, that uh, the 21st September was World Alzheimer's Day. Research into this is still much less than for other major medical problems. And so I asked the Leader of the House for a debate on this subject which affects so many of our constituents. Hegel said, Hegel said that life has value only when it has something valuable as its object. Let it be our object never to forget those who can no longer remember. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, I have so much sympathy with what my right hon. Friend says, uh, and dementia is something that hits families particularly hard. Sometimes it hits the carers much more uh, than the individual who is suffering from it. And All of us will have known people suffering from dementia and how hard it is for families as they are forgotten by the person they have been closest to. So I think it is a worthy subject uh, for debate. I am sorry not to be able to promise it in government time, but I think in adjournment debate time or indeed backbench business time, it would certainly have my support if I was still a backbencher. Now, Mr. Carmichael. Speaker, can I take the Leader of the House back to his assertion that the 12 bills that have been started by the government and are still outstanding are somehow blocked by this House. Can I just offer him one example, the Fisheries Bill, which is of tremendous importance to my constituents. What passed this House at second reading without division, as I recall, it was in committee with only one minor amendment made to it. There is a broad measure of cross-party support, but yet it has sat in parliamentary limbo since the end of November last year. If there is a blockage, that blockage surely is within government and not parliament. Will we get that bill before the government tries to prorogue again? I am um, grateful to the right hon. Gentleman for making the point. Uh, the Government is satisfied that all the bills that are needed prior to leaving the European Union on the 31st uh, of October are in place, save for a withdrawal agreement bill, should we get an agreement before that, and therefore it is not essential that these bills make further progress. However, I would add that one of the reasons they have not made progress is that they have been, in other cases, amended in such a way as they do not achieve the object of government policy. Uh, well, the, 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 the chuntering from a sedentary position says fisheries. That does not stop the bill being amended when it comes back, either here or in another place. And there is no certainty that these bills will get through without actually doing things that are contrary to government policy. And therefore, it is unlikely they will make progress. Tracy Crouch. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was humbled to be asked in January 2018 to become the world's first loneliness minister in order to continue the work at the highest level that our late colleague Joe Cox had championed. 
On the 15th of October last year, it was my privilege to publish the Government's loneliness strategy, the foundation for a decade of work ahead. But does the Leader of the House agree with me that the best way we could talk about Joe's legacy is for there to be an oral statement on the 15th from the Government updating the House on progress in implementing the recommendations from the strategy and on a date as close to the anniversary a debate in government time on loneliness so we can champion the work of those trying to keep society connected and celebrate those famous words from Joe that even now we still have more that unites us than divides us. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I think that last point is absolutely true. We all have more that unites us than divides us. Uh, may I congratulate my hon. Friend, who has made a real mark in this area, particularly uh, as the world's first, the world's first loneliness minister. I know the whole House will welcome all that she has done and continues to do so to build upon the legacy of Joe Cox. It is true that people who are lonely are more likely to be readmitted to hospital, visit a GP or accident and emergency, enter local authority residential care and perform poorly, perform poorly at work. All of this comes at a cost to the individual, to communities, to employers and to public services. We want to do everything we can to ease those burdens. Tackling loneliness requires society-wide change. We have been working in partnership with businesses to capture and share the work they are doing to help tackle loneliness in the wider community and to encourage employers to tackle loneliness amongst their employees. As regards a debate, it is difficult to promise a particular debate in government time, but if the House is reopened on the 14th of October with a Queen's speech, then of course the Queen's speech is a time to raise any matter that an honourable or right honourable member feels is suitable, and it would be a good occasion to bring these matters to wider attention. Take in. Speaker, uh, my constituent, Kayleigh Moran, was the victim of a serial rapist, Demetrius Aspiotis, when working in Corfu. In 2010, he was sentenced to 52 years in prison. So Kayleigh was shocked to learn through the media of his very early release. Can we have a statement from the Foreign Secretary on what discussions have been had with Greece about the very early release of convicted rapists and the impact on the safety of British women abroad? Oh, Mr Speaker, this is something that uh, must be taken with enormous seriousness. That 52-year sentence indicates the brutality and horror of what must have happened to the honourable gentleman's constituent, and to be released so soon seems to indicate that um, the consequences of his action are not being justly uh, imposed upon him. I will, of course, bring this to the attention of the Foreign Secretary and will send a written answer to the honourable gentleman, but I am very glad he has brought this to the attention of the House. Indeed. Sir Patrick McLaughlin. Can I join the Shadow Leader of the House in asking for a debate on the Electoral Commission? Is my right honourable friend aware that the Electoral Commission have referred very many people to the police for investigation? Those investigations have got nowhere. This reflects uh, professional people employed by all of the parties uh, and other organisations as well. And when a government body is responsible for referring people to the police, they really had not ought to do so unless there was very, very good information that there was likely to be a prosecution. And the Electoral Commission, on a number of occasions, have referred people, and there has been no such prosecution. Um, uh, thank you. My right honourable friend raises a matter of the greatest seriousness that the Electoral Commission is publicly funded and has to be held accountable for its actions. To say that somebody is referred to the police is a great blot on their reputation, um, on uh, their ability to carry out their functions if they are elected to office, because a whiff of suspicion will be around them. And therefore, he is quite right to say that any suggestion of a police referral must only be done when there is a very high likelihood uh, of success. Um, I think this is more a matter for the Backbench Business Committee, but it is indeed a serious matter. Mr. Creasy. May I thank the Leader of the House for illustrating so beautifully why so many of us have fought the concept of Parliament being prorogued and indeed a recess in setting forward a date for the Domestic Abuse Bill to get its second reading and thus proving that there is business 
across the House people want to see move forward that we could be doing and work that we could be doing in this place that our constituents would value. Last night, I raised with him the fact that the government has missed an important reporting deadline in its work to tackle abuse against women, in particular a report to the UN on addressing the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Can he tell us when we will see that report from the government? And also, can he tell us when he envisages the third, the committee stage rather, of the domestic abuse bill happening? And if, given the widespread support for this legislation in its current form, he will commit to having that on the floor of the House so that we can all contribute to making this a country where everyone is safe. Uh, I'm grateful to the uh, Honourable Lady, and I'm so pleased that she is welcoming the Government's schedule of business for next week. Uh, as I said in this House yesterday, this same bill would have been a major part uh, of the Queen's speech had it come at the Queen's speech uh, instead of next week, and that this bill is something that the Government is particularly and singularly uh, committed to. So it is an important uh, uh, bill that is going to be brought forward, showing the Government's intent. And I think the speed of its passage will be no faster and no slower coming next week than had it come in the Queen's speech. Uh, a number of colleagues across the House were in Bangladesh last week, uh, many of whom got to see the plight of the Rohingya. The reality is that the government has responded well in providing international aid, but there are 1.3 million displaced people who want to return home. Can we therefore have a, a debate in government time on what we can do as a country to enable those people to return home to Myanmar in safety and security and bring this to the attention of the world? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The plight of the Rohingya people is one of the great scandals of our time and that 1.3 million people are displaced is something that the world must be concerned about and it is one of the areas where our overseas aid budget is most properly used. Um, I'm sure that ministers are aware of this. There are no immediate plans for a debate. I don't want to refer everything to the Backbench Business Committee but I think it is once again something that falls in the chairman's lap. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm really pleased uh, that we will be having the second reading of the domestic abuse yeah. bill next week. Excellent. However, I know the Leader of the House is a stickler for procedure mm. and doing things correctly. Mm. So, can he just explain to me, as a mere novice, having only been in the House 14 years, how it is that the government have already announced the statutory role of a domestic abuse commissioner, oh. despite the pre legislative no, committee which I served on with the Honourable Lady? who serves as the chair of the select committee, where we made recommendations about how that post should be a full-time post and not a two- or three-day-a-week post, yeah. and we also made recommendations about the budget and staffing yeah. requirements. So how is it that that has been allowed to be uh, made, that yeah. appointment, when we haven't actually had the second reading of the bill or gone through the committee stage or third reading or the final stages of the bill or it going through the House of Lords? Yeah. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady has longer experience in the House than uh, I do by a full Parliament, so I bow to her superior knowledge on procedural matters. I, I would have thought it would be welcome that the Government has got on and appointed um, Nicole Jacobs as the first Domestic Abuse Commissioner. And of course, what goes through into the Bill, what is passed by Parliament, will be the law, and that will be the standing of the post of the Commissioner. But this is merely an opportunity to get on with things, to push ahead, and I would have thought it would be welcome. Fiona Bruce. Mr. Speaker, can we have a debate on minimum unit pricing? Uh, ministers, when this was introduced in Scotland, said that, they would, uh, in, uh, that in England they would await the outcome of uh, that implementation. And there's been a report today that implementation in Scotland is benefiting those who are drinking at risk of their health. Can we have a debate on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Everything the Honourable Lady says I take with the greatest seriousness. She is the most wonderful campaigner and aims to make the lives of people in this country better by everything that she does. And I particularly admire her support for the uh, family. I think the issue she raises is a crucial one, but is much more, once again, a matter for the Backbench Business Committee. Anna Subri. 
Speaker, could the Leader of the House tell us, please, which ministers will be taking questions on which days, and are the ballots open so that we can submit our questions? And given that the Queen's speech apparently is going to be held on the 14th of October, could he tell us, please, when Parliament will be prorogued for that occasion? Uh, uh, um, thank you, Mr Speaker. As I understand, the Chancellor will be taking questions on Tuesday. It is normal for a three-day uh, rotor to be set. Uh, it will be Monday, but it will be available in the table office, and the Pri Prime Minister will be, I assume, making his um, normal appearance on Wednesday. But the table office is the right place to go for those questions. Well, it's a question of a, a medical doctor or a doctor of philosophy. I think on this occasion I'll take the, the medical doctor, Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr... Doctor! He's a very distinguished fellow, but he's not a doctor. We'll come to the fellow in due course. Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know how much my right honourable friend works hard for his constituents, but perhaps one constituent in particular he has worked especially hard for, and that is his constituents, Max. Max, who has Batten's disease and was needing Brineura, an important drug for this rare and very, very unpleasant condition, which ultimately would lead to his death without this, without this work. He had an urgent question on the topic before um, the recess in the summer, and just before the prorogation ceremony, um, ha, uh, just after sorry, the prorogation ceremony, we heard from NHS England that this drug will be now be available. Does my right honourable friend? Um, feel that a debate on how the rare diseases protocols are done would be beneficial to ensure that other people do not have to wait so long as Max has. Can I just say to colleagues, perhaps I should have explained, but, and I will now do so, the next debate, if it's to have two hours, needs to start at three o'clock. If people insist on making long interventions, they're stopping others. They must know they're stopping others. It's as simple and incontrovertible as that. The Leader of the House. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mr Speaker. I am grateful for that question. Um, the, the issue with Max, who has Batten disease, uh, is a, one of the greatest difficulty, and I am so pleased that the drug is now being made available. But I agree with um, my hon. Friend that there is a need for greater debate and discussion on the availability of um, medicines for rare diseases. Uh, again, I think it is backbench business matter, but it is something the Government is taking seriously, and I am grateful to NHS England that they have found the funding so that Max will get the drug he so needs. One sentence, Stephen. Stephen Doughty. Um, on incineration of waste. Many constituents in my uh, constituency in St Melons and Rumney are very concerned about the locating of a new waste incinerator, but also the emissions from vehicles, big HGVs, going to that plant. I'm sure the Leader of the House would agree that's an issue on which would be interest across the House. Um, um, uh, Mr Speaker, I think that's ideal for an adjournment debate, and I believe you're open to applications. Dr Matthew Offer. Yeah. Speaker, our parliamentary democracy has taken a battering in the last few years. So can I ask the Leader of the House if he would bring forward legislation in the Queen's speech to ensure that recommendations of the boundary review are implemented and we all represent um, our constituents of an equal proportion and size? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the principle that constituencies should have the same number of electors in them is a very good and important one. The I, I do make an exception for the Honourable Gentleman for Nihiling and Anyar, uh, which for particular geographical reasons has slightly fewer constituents, but may I say the constituents there are some of the finest people in this country, so I wouldn't quite say they count double, but they are heading in that direction. Uh, actually, when the matter was being debated some years ago, I thought it should be created a rotten borough for the Honourable Gentleman, because he brings so much um, levity and pleasure to this House through his interjections. Uh, the, 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 however, my, my, my opinion... Often, often deliberately. <laughs> Um, so I am very sympathetic to my, what my hon. Friend says. The statutory instrument is prepared but is being considered um, and will be brought forward if there is a suitable opportunity. Angus Brendan McNeill. God bless you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, can I add my uh, voice to the hon. Member for Putney, the right hon. Member for Putney, and make a plea for the Child Refugee, uh, Child Refugee Family Reunion Bill amongst the private members' bill that should see some progress here? And can I also say, Mr Speaker, that we are seeing a, a chamber today that is actually a model of civility all afternoon. It is back to what Parliament was compared to last night. And can I maybe add a suggestion to improve and to get rid of the toxicity and the disorder we saw last night? that Acts of Parliament get referred by their proper names as being assented to by the Queen, uh, and we don't give them monikers or pejorative titles 
They're just called, and I'm sure the leader of the House of one of those sticklers uh, would, would like this to happen, not tabloid monikers, and perhaps the Speaker might indeed rule it disorderly, because this was the act that was stoking the fires of toxicity and disorder last night. Um, uh, th- th- thank you, Mr Speaker. A uh, stickler though I am, I think... Col- <laughs> what? I can't believe the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Hendon, has forgotten the fact of his pearls of wisdom so soon after he uttered them. Maybe he's got a second set of pearls in mind, I don't know, but it may have to wait. I do beg the Leader's pardon. Thank you, um, um, Mr Speaker. Um, I I think it's perfectly reasonable to refer to bills by colloquial names. That is a traditional and perfectly reasonable thing to do. And, of course, it is a political matter, and that people will use the names that they use. And the um, forms on language in this House are well set out. And, as Mr Speaker said earlier, nothing disorderly happened yesterday. And I think we have to be really careful. Civility is important. Being polite to each other is important. When we see that members on either side are vilified or threats to their safety are made, we must oppose them vigorously. But that is such a different order of magnitude from robust debate in this House. And to conflate the two is a fundamental error and risks making the serious nature of what is happening to some members appear to be part of back and forth (coughs) politicisation. It is not. It is really serious. But the surrender bill term is one that is a matter of taste and not a matter of um, any real importance. And I'm quite happy with the term surrender bill. Tim Lawton. Speaker, I'm sorry I'm not a doctor, but I am at least a patient and patient. Um, The leader mentioned many uh, SIs, but he didn't make any mention of the Civil Partnership Marriages and Deaths Registration, etc., now ACT, which received royal assent uh, in May, and which requires an SI by the beginning of December in order for opposite-sex couples to enter into a civil partnership by the 31st of December, and many bookings have provisionally been made. So can he update the House to guarantee that that SI will go through in good time, because many Many happy couples are expecting it. Well, I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for uh, my right honourable friend. I'm so sorry uh, for raising. You can't. A gentleman of his seniority. I do apologise. Anyway, um, the point he makes is an important one. I will take it up with the relevant secretary of state to see when that statutory instrument is planned. David Hanson. As we approach the end of this session, could I just look at one particular issue, which is government consultations? The Home Office issued a consultation on air rifle safety in October 2017, which closed in February 2018. We still not have had the government response to that consultation. That's simply not acceptable. Could the Leader of the House look at that consultation period? It's being considered very carefully. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who I've advised I was going to mention uh, in the Chamber, said in the Chamber on Wednesday, the automotive sector, who I met this week, confirmed that they were ready. The retail sector said they were ready. The representatives of that industry, who were at the meeting, however, denied this was the case, saying, amongst many other things, that the claims made in here did not bear reality. Mm -hmm. Similar concerns have been raised by other industries and sectors. Given the comments were made in this Chamber by the Minister who is responsible for the UK, UK's Brexit planning, and they appear to bear little relationship to the situation on the ground, would the government do the Parliament the courtesy of scheduling a full debate on this issue to get to the bottom of things mm-hmm. and give the right honourable gentleman a chance to provide much needed clarity on just what exactly we'll be facing yeah, in a few yeah, weeks' yeah. time? Mr Speaker, I'm sure what the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said is entirely accurate. You can always find some Ramona to disagree. Um, Mr Speaker, yet another ATM in Blantyre in my constituency turned fee charging in the last few days. If the Speaker of the House wants to strike some consensus in the next few weeks, can we have a debate in government time about access to cash? Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I think all of us always want access to cash, and I think it's very important, uh, particularly in rural communities, that access to cash should remain uh, possible. Um, many people want to carry on using traditional forms of payment. So I think what he is calling for is not unreasonable, but I am afraid I am once again going to refer him to the Chairman of the Backbench Business Committee. But he was listening closely earlier. Until 2.30 tomorrow, applications are still being received. Thank you very much. 
the Leader of the House announced uh, more than a dozen pieces of business himself disproves the nonsense that we could have a luxurious five-week prorogation. Yeah, There's yeah, tons yeah, of business yeah. that Not needs so. to be attended to, including the lack of progress on the trade bill. Yeah, we have a dysfunctional true. arrangement for scrutinising the trade arrangements with the United States, for example. Those mm -hmm. arrangements are continuing. It's totally unacceptable. When will we get a chance to scrutinise these things according to law? Um, the trade bill has a bit on a customs union in it, which would be an absolute disaster. It won't come back in that form. Uh, after being admitted to hospital 28 times in three years for acute respiratory problems because she lived 25 metres from a road in South London that exceeded legal to her pollution limits. When will he find time to debate a clean air bill or bring forward the environment bill to include those provisions to, so 62,000 people don't die prematurely a year? I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising that very sad uh, case. Um, it is obviously important that we have clean air, and the government has an ambitious policy to improve the quality of air in this country, and that is being pushed forward with. Dr. Rupa Hark. Um, speaker, can I thank you for your words last night, acknowledging that it's ethnic minority women that often bear the brunt of words by members of this House, not only in here, but columns denigrating women as letterboxes and uh, bank robbers. I wanted to put to the Leader of the House, however, this point made by Matt from Ealing to me. He says he's watching with despair. I think, like me, it was quite late. We don't all have nanny to do our childcare. I was watching from home last night very late. He says there's a continual refusal on the part of the Prime Minister to answer any of the questions put to him. Is it not within the remit for them to answer the questions put to them? Does he not agree with me that if the quality of the exchanges was better, there'd be more respect outside for us and we'd be able to do our jobs better? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I do share the Honourable Lady's concern with the quality of exchanges and the embarrassment of the benches opposite, who saw their leader having his Neil Kinnock moment yesterday. Tim Farron. Within the House, uh, make time for my now deprorogued bill on access to radiotherapy treatment because it is wrong, surely, that people cancer sufferers should have to travel day after day, a week after week, for three hour round trips for cancer treatment. Wouldn't it be right to place satellite units in places like Kendall so we can have longer lives, shorter journeys? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The general point on private members' bills is that if we get to a new session, there will be more Fridays, there will be a new ballot, and there will be the opportunity for members to bring forward their bills. That would be the best way to go about it. Chris Bryant. Wouldn't it improve the atmosphere in all of our debates in the House if we returned to an older tradition and took an, a self-denying ordinance and all of us refused to clap? Yes, yes, and yes. David Linden. By his own admission, the Leader of the House is not very familiar with nappies or how they work, but I'm sure he's very familiar with my Nappies Environmental Standards Bill. So, will they agree to meet with me to look at when we can get a second reading for this bill and might even be able to bring in a reusable nappy from Pot Spots in Queensland? I am very grateful to the uh, Honourable Gentleman. I have a general rule which I am happy to tell the House. As Leader of the House, I will meet any member who wants to see me to discuss nappies or any other subject that comes to mind. Um, I think it is important that uh, Honourable and Right Honourable Members have access to people, and I know, Mr Speaker, you do the same. Kerry McCarthy. Speak. If I can start by asking the Leader of the House to pass on here my congratulations to his niece, who I gather was selected for Stafford last night. Um, slightly disappointed she's not standing against me again, given the 2017 result, though. But on a more serious note, um, we both raised at Prime Minister's questions before the summer recess the case of Jake Ogmore, my constituent, and access to the drug spin Raza. It's been raised a number of times in various different forums in this House. What does the Leader of House that the House think that we can do to try to make sure that Jake's case is raised again? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and may I thank um, the Honourable Lady for her characteristically generous words. That's very much appreciated and it is, is kind of her as my neighbour in Somerset, and I will certainly pass that on uh, to Theodora. Um, I am now bound by collective responsibility, but my views on Spinraza have not changed since I became uh, Leader of the House. Uh, she has quite rightly raised this issue, but I will write to the Secretary of State for Health making the point that she has made. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I draw the Leader of the House's attention to early day motion 2719, celebrating the football career and life of Fernando Rickson, 
the former captain of Rangers Football Club, who died last week as a result of a long battle against motor neuron disease. So can I ask the Leader of the House if we can have a statement or a debate on how the State can support those with this illness? Uh, uh, thank you, um, Mr Speaker. And I, I understand a foundation has been set up uh, in honour of Mr Rickson to raise funds to help people and to um, ha have further research into these diseases. Um, I think he's absolutely right that motor neurone disease is a particularly horrible illness and one that the health service will need to look at with importance. And I will pass on his comments to the Secretary of State. Kevin Brennan. Mr Speaker, can I commend the Leader for agreeing to meet all members? I will always find if any Minister refuses to meet a member, a diet of ten written parliamentary questions a day until further notice soon does the trick, and that's just a tip for newer members. But on the issue of prorogation, um, I understand why he said he can't give us the date because of his consultations with Black Royal about the arrangements for the, the, uh, the state opening. But can he at least confirm, which I'm sure he can for the benefit of the House, that the government does not intend to prorogue next week? Um, uh, Mr Speaker, um, first of all, the point on um, written questions. I think I put over 300 written questions down on the European arrest warrant. It didn't necessarily get me what I wanted, but it certainly kept somebody busy. Um, prorogation will meet the judgment of the court and therefore will be the time necessary to move to a Queen's speech and no more. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the House has already dingied my request to have my supervised drug consumption bill heard um, in the House, but could he perhaps instead, uh, an alternative strategy, speak to um, ministers in the Home Office to ask if a statutory instrument could be laid to create an exemption to the Misuse of Drugs Act to allow Glasgow to get on with the job of saving lives? Yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, this is uh, an opportunity for issues exactly like that to be raised, and I will always pass on members' comments and requests for statutory instruments to the relevant Secretary of State. Of course I will do that. Well, today's uh, urgent question on uh, the um, arms trade to uh, Saudi Arabia indicates that there is a bigger issue here. Will the Government um, schedule a longer debate in Government time, and will the Leader of the House in particular consider turning the Committees for Arms Controls into a standalone committee, which is in his gift? Leader of the House. Um, Mr Speaker, very few things are within my gift that specifically. I think it's in uh, other people's gift as well. Um, the issue was raised. There was an urgent question. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman knows how to ask for Standing Order 24 debates or to go to the Backbench Business Committee, but the Government has announced its schedule of business for next week. Graham P. Jones. Can we have a debate on the strategic road network in the North West, particularly the M65 extension? through to the M1 and perhaps he could advise me how best to pursue this either through his good office or the office of the right honourable member for West Dorset. Uh, uh, thank you Mr Speaker. I mean, I'm getting slightly repetitive at this stage but I think the best opportunity for that would be during the Queen's speech once we've got a new session of Parliament and when there is time, days of debate, where members can raise with a minister present really serious and important issues, uh, particularly ones relating to infrastructure. So I hope that he will do that. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The, the collapse of Thomas Cook has deprived um, around 300 people, based on my constituency, of their livelihoods. And I've been contacted by a Thomas Cook employee um, suggesting that the Transport Secretary, uh, some of the figures used by the Transport Secretary were incorrect. Yeah. Um, and moreover, um, that tens of millions of pounds were stripped from the business just hours before it became insolvent. Can we have a debate on this very important issue, please? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I am very sorry to hear of the job losses in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency. Um, it is always a blow to the individuals concerned when businesses fail. It seems to me that really serious questions have been raised about the way money was taken out of Thomas Cook, the payments that were made, and other more senior ministers than I have made these points as well. I unquestionably believe in free markets, but free markets require people to behave properly and to view the companies that they are running as a trust 
rather than something which can simply be stripped of its assets and run dry. So I think there is a very good argument for what he is saying, and I hope he will have his application in by 2.30 tomorrow to the Chairman of the Backbench Business Committee. Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have a constituent whose husband was declined a credit card because their bank classed a car lease as unsecured debt, when clearly that is actually secured debt. Yet she herself is able to get a credit card from the same bank, which is illogical. As the Ombudsman says, banks can set rules as they see fit. My constituent would like a government statement on how we can set more competent credit assessment rules for banks that they can be held to account on. Yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, I think that really is a matter for the Government of the Bank of England, but it may be worth taking up with the about-to-be-elected um, Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, who may be able to call him in to ask him about the important questions uh, of credit control by banks. And that election will take place in the course of October, as I suspect the Honourable Gentleman will know. Yes, I will come to points of order now. Uh, point of order, Liz Savile Roberts. The Supreme Court told us with great clarity this week that accountability lies at the heart of parliamentary democracy. I would seek to know what resorts do we have when the Prime Minister respects no boundaries in his tactics, language and conduct, and that in order to avoid or deflect accountability. Could he advise me, therefore, on the applicability of either an impeachment motion or, alternatively, Censure by the House relating to the conduct of the Prime Minister. Yeah. Honourable yeah. yeah. Lady, for her point of order and for her characteristic courtesy in giving me advance notice of her intention to raise it, what I would say to the Right Honourable Lady at this stage is that there are various ways in which Honourable and Right Honourable Members can seek to debate the conduct of Ministers and indeed of others on the floor of the House. My suggestion to her is that she should visit the table office where the clerks will be ready to advise her in more detail on the options which are open to her. Uh, point of order, Dr Matthew Offord. Mr Speaker, back in March I was invited by the Suffer North West London Food Bank to visit and understand the work they are taking part in on behalf of my constituents. I followed the parliamentary protocol of informing the member for Brent Central that I would be visiting Suffer as it is in her constituency. So it came as a, quite a surprise that the Brent Central Labour Party and Brent Momentum tweeted an identical picture of six men saying that they heard I was planning a photo op and were going to go along to make their feelings known. Now, neither my office or sufferer advised anyone of the meeting, and I'm not going to impugn the reputation of a number of the member, but can you advise me, please, if any member or indeed the staff in their parliamentary office is responsible for leaking the information about the whereabouts or location of a member, what action will the House take against them? I hope the Honourable General will forgive me, but even if he doesn't, I cannot possibly be expected to know the circumstances which the Honourable Gentleman has just described. That's the first point. Secondly, although he has kindly told the House that he informed the Honourable Lady of his intention to raise the matter, I have not heard her viewpoint on it. Manifestly, it cannot be here now at 3.01 on Thursday afternoon a matter for adjudication by the chair. I should have thought that that was readily apparent. So the honourable gentleman has made his point and registered his displeasure, and I'm sorry if he has felt ill-served by the way in which he has been treated or the reaction to his visit. But palpably, it's not a matter for me now. And we, we do have other business which is quite heavily subscribed, which the Honourable Gentleman might concede is perhaps more pressing. Point of order, Diana Johnson. Mr Speaker, you often give advice to members of this House that they should persist, persist, persist. So I'm going to attempt to persist. I wrote to the Prime Minister seven weeks ago seeking... Um, a reply on the basis of the need for compensation to be paid to those who had been affected by the contaminated blood scandal on the basis that one victim was dying every four days. I then asked the Leader of the House three weeks ago if he would assist me in getting at least the courtesy of a reply. 
I sent my uh, letters to the leader. Since then, I've heard nothing. I've not had the courtesy of a reply. And I just wondered, Mr Speaker, what your view is about a Member of Parliament writing to the Prime Minister with the whole range of the civil service that he has at his disposal <coughs> and not being able to provide a, at least an acknowledgement of a letter. Well, frankly, I'm astonished by that. I'm astonished by that. There is a very long established convention in this place that questions to ministers are answered in a timely and preferably a substantive fashion, of which the corollary, and I say this as much for the benefit of those who want our proceedings to be intelligible as to members of the House who may know already, is that letters that are sent to ministers should be timiously answered. And the Leader of the House, at any given time, has always accepted a responsibility to chase progress on these matters. And I hope the Right Honourable Gentleman will forgive me if I say that the role of Leader of the House could almost have been invented for the benefit of the Right Honourable Gentleman member for North East Somerset. And I know that he will take his responsibility in this matter extremely seriously. And I hope that he will chase a reply. What I also say to the Honourable Lady, as I happen to be very familiar with the issue, though the principle applies whatever the issue, but as I happen to be very familiar with the issue, and I've granted several urgent questions to the Honourable Lady over the years, as she's been an indefatigable campaigner on this matter, is that whether she gets a reply, substantive or not, satisfactory or not, on this matter, if the Honourable Lady wishes, when we return, to pursue this matter on the floor of the House, she will get the chance to pursue it all right.